begin. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the last talk of the Work of Care in Russia lecture series. My name is Svetlana Borodina. I am a postdoctoral fellow at the Harriman Institute and the organizer and the moderator of this series. It's been a great privilege to learn uh, from the work of excellent historians and anthropologists about the geopolitical, biopolitical, socioeconomic, and cultural intricacies of providing care in Russia. For those who um, missed our previous talks, uh, just a quick announcement that all four of them are available on the Harriman Institute's YouTube channel, uh, as will be uh, this talk. And so please don't hesitate to watch them as recordings uh, at the time uh, that's convenient for you. And uh, just before we begin, um, a couple of logistical comments for me. So this talk is a webinar, which means that our audience can participate in the talk by posing questions to our speaker. And um, the audience can tune in on Zoom or on YouTube, uh, where we are currently streaming live. Please don't hesitate to pose your questions. Uh, you can do so um, on the Q&A feature if you are connecting through Zoom, or you can type your questions uh, into the chat box if you are watching this um, video, this uh, talk on uh, YouTube. And I will pose those questions uh, to our speaker uh, upon the completion of his presentation during the Q&A session. Many thanks to the Harriman Institute for the support of this series and to Carly Jackson for helping with the event organization. And finally, I'm so excited to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Eugene Reiko. Dr. Reiko is an associate professor at the Department of Comparative Human Development at the University of Chicago. He is a cultural and medical anthropologist uh, with interests encompassing the anthropology of science, biomedicine, and psychiatry, addiction and its treatment, suggestion and healing, and the post-socialist transformations in Eurasia. His work appeared in such flagship academic journals as Trans Transcultural Psychiatry, Annual Review of Anthropology, Medical Anthropology, Culture Medicine, Psychiatry, to name just a few. And his book, Governing Habits, Treating Alcoholism in the Post-Soviet Clinic was published by Cornell University Press in the fall of 2016. This book examines the political, economic, epidemiological, and clinical changes that have transformed the knowledge and medical treatment of alcoholism and addiction in Russia over the preceding 20 years. Today, we're going to hear Dr. Reichel's talk that presents his book's arguments. With excitement about such a wonderful finale of the series, I turn it over to Eugene. Thank you so much, Svetlana. Thank you for um, inviting me. Um, and uh, thank you to the Harriman Institute. Um, it was, um, yeah, hold on one second, I just need to get my... Uh, Um, it's, it's really been, uh, it's really an honor uh, to be uh, presenting here. Uh, so, uh, and it was a real treat to get to um, go back and uh, think about this, uh, prepare this talk, uh, thinking about the, the book a few years uh, after its uh, publication. Uh, I wanna give you a quick uh, overview of uh, the talk today. I'm gonna say a few words first about the uh, origins of the project. Uh, give you a little bit of a sense of the research design, setting, and scope of the book. And then I'm going to trace uh, one of the central arguments of the book, uh, which has to do with this idea of therapeutic legitimacy. And I'm going to um, focus on two sort of give you two stories. One, which is it about uh, our official narcology or addiction medicine and suggestion based treatments. And the second about uh, domesticating Alcoholics Anonymous in St. Petersburg. And then I'll have a few concluding thoughts. Um, so I wanna start out just with a few words about the origins of this project. Uh, my initial interest in developing a project focused on alcohol, uh, particularly on health related perspectives on alcohol in Russia, emerged from readings into the so-called post-Soviet demographic crisis. The sharpest changes in mortality rates, um, which many of you might be familiar with, were reflected in falling life expectancy, occurred during the early 1990s, during the years of the most dramatic social and political economic changes in Russia. Between 1990 and 1994, for example, male life expectancy 
plummeted from 63.8 to 57.7 years, a drop which one group of health statisticians called beyond the peacetime experience of industrialized countries. Um, female life expectancy also dropped, though it remained uh, higher overall. Uh, and while researchers disagreed about how to interpret the relationship between decreasing life expectancy uh, among Russian men and broader processes of post-Soviet uh, transformation, there was significant agreement that alcohol consumption and alcohol-related harm had played a, a central role. Um, and there's a lot that, that can be unpacked there, and I discussed this, the demographic crisis uh, in more detail in chapter one of the book. But for now, I just want to notice, um, mention that, um, that these discussions really pointed to the way in which, for me, alcohol consumption was implicated in social transformation, in debates about that transformation. And all of this got me interested initially in how alcoholism and substance abuse, uh, substance use disorders were addressed in the medical domain. So what struck me as I began to um, explore um, and think about uh, accounts of narcology as Russian addiction medicine is known, uh, was that there seemed to be both some key differences in the ways that alcoholism and addiction were understood and treated when compared to say uh, North America and a sense that these differences were the causes of, or at least related to failures of care. For example, starting in the 1990s, a number of public health workers, psychologists and others um, from North America and Western Europe began to study, uh, visit the clinical institutions in Russia that address substance abuse, often as consultants to internationally funded health public health programs. Their reports almost all de describe narcology as backwards, stuck in the dark ages, uh, somehow having failed to live up to um, advance along the global uh, contemporary global medicine. Um, these arguments were not limited to visiting specialists. For example, Vladimir Mendelevich, um, a professor at Kazan State Medical University and an outspoken critic of what he calls official narcology, has argued many of the same uh, basic assumptions underlying narcology are faulty or out of sync with addiction medicine throughout the world. Uh, this is just one quote from a, a, a piece he wrote in 2004. Uh, and it really reflects an argument he's continued to make uh, throughout. Uh, many principles of Russian narcology contradict healthy reason and diverge from the agreed upon foundations of the worldwide professional community. The entire world criticizes the practice of compulsory treatment for addicts. We are for it. Everyone is working to, reduce, to introduce harm reduction programs. We are against them. Everyone condemns paternalistic and manipulative methods in narcology. We support them. And by we, he is here referring to, of course, uh, the kind of official narcology, which he does not uh, himself identify with. Um, he points here that the three specific issues that have been central to critiques of Russian narcology. Uh, compulsory treatment for addicts refers to the legal measures requiring drug addicts to receive treatment, but also to the frequent calls for a revival of compulsory treat treatment for alcoholics. Um, the paucity of harm reduction programs in Russia, and in particular, the prohibition of opiate substitution therapy, employing either methadone or buprenorphine has been a particularly contentious issue in public health circles, where these methods are widely accepted as um, reducing uh, bloodborne infections such as HIV and hepatitis. Um, and finally, by paternalistic and manipulative methods, Mendelevich refers to a set of closely related therapeutic techniques uh, for alcoholism, uh, which rely on hypnotic suggestion and which are collectively referred to as coding or kadirvanya. I'll talk about these in a, in a little while. Many critics have pointed to what they see as these treatments to disregard for a normative model of patient autonomy instead of treating patients as autonomous, rational, potentially self-knowing individuals. These methods are described as relying on people's ignorance or belief to frighten them into sobriety. Um, the more I learned about um, narcology, um, the more it seemed like an ideal uh, anthropological object. And so I eventually undertook this project as a historical and ethnographic study of the clinical uh, treatment of alcoholism in St. Petersburg, uh, Russia. 
I sought to understand it as a changing domain of knowledge and expertise, as a circulation of changing medical technologies, and in a site where distinct forms of personhood are enabled. Um, I wondered, what were the political, economic, epistemic, and clinical changes that have transformed the medical management of alcoholism in Russia during the post-Soviet years? What could debates over appropriate treatments for alcoholism tell us about broader questions? The authorization of expert knowledge or the transformations of health and so social citizenship in Russia. Additionally, of particular interest to our conversation today, how did patients and clinicians understand in varied and distinct ways what constituted care? Um, and I just wanna emphasize that really like in, in many ways I came, what drew me into the project was that this uh, domain of medicine seemed in, in some ways a very classical kind of anthropological object in that it seemed to have very different um, assumptions often embedded in it about what, what alcoholism was, what, uh, what illness, what disease was, um, than the ones that I um, had been socialized into in, in North America. Um, so a few words about the design uh, setting and, and scope of this research uh, behind the book. Uh, this project was largely based in 14 months of ethnographic field work carried out in a number of addiction treatment facilities in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, most of this field work was carried out uh, ages ago now between 2002 and 2004. And, and I really wanna emphasize um, you know, that this is in some ways, this book really captures this particular historical and social moment. Um, while I also spent a month at a, um, a commercial uh, addiction clinic um, and, and a bit less time at others, interviewed narcologists and psychiatrists in private practice, sat in on a series of training lectures on narcology for physicians, attended open sessions of Alcoholics Anonymous uh, and seances conducted by a self-proclaimed orthodox psychotherapist, uh, the majority of the field work took place in two institutions. The first of these was St. Petersburg's, St. Petersburg's uh, Municipal uh, Narcological Service, which consisted of outpatient clinics in each of the city's districts and a central 500 bed hospital for inpatient treatment. At the hospital, I followed physicians on their rounds, spent time with them in their offices. Um, most were uneasy with the idea of my spending time informally on the ward. Instead, they allowed me to speak to patients individually in consultation rooms. I also carried out extensive interviews with physicians based in the outpatient clinics. If the hospital and the clinics were the site of what Mendelevich called uh, official narcology in St. Petersburg, my other key field site represented a set of approaches for treating alcoholism, which were newer to Russia. This was the House of Hope on the Hill, uh, Dom Nadirsti Nagaria, a center in the St. Petersburg area providing free of charge rehab for um, alcoholism, which had been founded and was funded largely by a US donor. The rehabilitation program at the house was primarily drawn on the Minnesota model, a widely used 12-step pro uh, based protocol for inpatient substance abuse rehabilitation. When I expressed interest in conducting research at the House of Hope and made it clear that I was willing to make myself useful, the response was enthusiastic. Since money funding the house and its clinical technologies flowed from the US, there was a great deal of translation to be done in the management of the center, and I was soon working on English and Russian texts for reports, letters, brochures, and web postings. Uh, at the same time, I was began regularly taking part in daily activities. Uh, I was allowed to interview patients, join them for lectures and conversations, sit in on meetings with the counseling staff, uh, and, and so on. I also interviewed staff members, uh, most of whom identified as recovering alcoholics at, at length. Now, there's a couple of arguments um, at the center of the book, but for the purposes of this talk, I wanna focus on one of these because I think it really lines up more closely with the issues of care that are at the focus of this series. So this argument has to do with what I refer to as therapeutic legitimacy, um, and which I interpret as um, closely related to the multiple processes through which patients uh, through which practitioners and adherents of various therapies and treatment uh, uh, managed the perception of their methods, their professions, 
and their individual capacities as efficient, uh, effective, sorry, and potent. I'll give a brief summary of the argument before expanding at length. What I'm gonna argue is that as a medical specialty, which was created by decree during the 1970s, the ethos and organization of Soviet narcology were much more closely aligned with the security and policing organ, organs of the Soviet party state than were those of other medical specialties. Moreover, legal provisions for involuntary treatment allowed narcologists to wield the threat of coercion with recalcitrant patients. Uh, what I argue is that during the 1990s and later, narcology experienced a crisis of authority as the legal means for involuntary treatment were removed, funding levels dropped, and new competitors emerged in the domain of alcoholism treatment. As these older kinds of bureaucratic authority fell away or became more tenuous, the forms of charismatic authority that narcologists had long been exercising in the clinic became increasingly important. In tracing the consequences of this shift, I focus on the discursive and institutional practices which clinicians and other practitioners enact and affirm uh, what I call therapeutic legitimacy. The idea builds on a claim that has been central to medical anthropology for decades, namely that while in the words of uh, Margaret Locke and Ving Kim uh, uh, Wing, uh, mastering biomedical technologies requires self-fashioning. Practitioner selves draw their power from the social relations that recognize this efficacy. Focusing on therapeutic legitimacy requires us to look beyond the formal criteria of training and credentialing, and instead to look on the much more diffuse, informal, everyday processes through which efficacious healing is enacted, affirmed, and challenged. Medical anthropologists have often drawn attention to the ways in which practitioners legitimize their claims and their practices by linking them to trad traditional bureaucratic and charismatic forms of authority. While such analyses imply that medical claims to legitimacy index some kind of very stable referent, such as medicine, I argue precisely that the stability often remains unclear and up for grabs. Thus, throughout the book, I trace how medical how therapeutic legitimacy is performed in specific interactions between clinicians and patients, in debates on the pages of medical journals and newspapers, in arguments made to this ethnographer. In theorizing therapeutic legitimacy, I link up longstanding anthropological literatures on symbolic efficacy and medical pluralism with contemporary discussions about the performance of expertise. Grigori, a 12-step counselor and stage actor in his previous life, once told me that he had added up the total length of time he had spent in psychiatric hospitals and come to the conclusion that it amounted to something like four years. All of these commitments had occurred at the end of alcoholic binges. In some cases, Grigori was admitted in a state of alcoholic psychosis. He described the profound sense of bewilderment and distrust he had felt toward the physicians in these institutions. None of my attempts to leave the madhouse early worked. There was simply no trust or understanding from the physician. You were always under his gaze, examining how you were behaving. I never knew how to behave. I didn't know, I didn't understand why I was there. While many facets of uh, Grigori's uh, experience shaped his memory of the psychiatric hospital, it was the relationship with the physician, the iconic clinical encounter, which seemed to encapsulate his predicament in a way that was both metaphorical and concretely remembered and felt. His evocation of the encounter between psychiatrist and patient strikingly echoes an argument that Michel Foucault made in many of his works, but that he stated with particular succinctness in his lectures titled Psychiatric Power. Why is it that one cannot leave the asylum? One cannot leave the asylum, not because the exit is very is far away, but because the entrance is too near, one never stops leaving the asylum and every encounter, every confrontation between the doctor and patient begins again and indefinitely, uh, indefinitely repeats this founding initial act by which madness will exist as reality and the psychiatrist will exist as doctor. So by now this argument or some version of it um, has been so widely discussed and disputed among historians and social scientists of psychiatry that it might sound too shop warm or, or, or too self-evident to mention. The idea is that the existence of madness is an epistemic object and psychiatry's claim to reveal the truth of that object 
not only undergirds psychiatry's legitimacy as a medical profession, but also intimately is linked to the psychiatrist's expertise of clinical authority over the patient. And yet, it's precisely the differences in how the authority of physicians as specialists was underwritten in the Soviet Union, as opposed to the liberal European settings, which Foucault and others founded their arguments on, um, make this notion worth revisiting. As several historians of medicine have argued, medicalization understood as a particular mode of knowledge and intervention underpinned by specialist authority of medical professions took on a different shape in the Soviet Union than in liberal Western European and North American states, uh, where it was underwritten by the professional autonomy of physicians. On the one hand, Soviet during the Soviet period, uh, the specialist power of medicine was celebrated, um, and yet any potential basis for physicians' corporate power or collective autonomy was undercut by the uh, party state. The simultaneous constraint of physicians' political and economic power and their promotion of their disciplinary power created a situation um, in which the setting of the clinic uh, took on a particularly important, uh, became a particularly important site for the exercise of professional authority. And that's an argument that Mark Field made and uh, uh, Michelle Rifkin-Fish also uh, uh, argues. Um, so this relationship between clinicians, uh, physicians' clinical authority and their relationship to the state was even more freighted and ambivalent in the case of narcology, which was uh, more a product of the Soviet party state than other, um, than other specialties. During the 1970s, uh, in part to alleviate the overcrowding of psychiatric hospitals with alcoholics, the Ministry of Health mandated the creation of an independent network for the clinical treatment of alcoholism and addiction. Um, this network included not only institutions run by, uh, like the hospital that were under the aegis of the Ministry of Health, but also ex in, uh, explicitly penal ones run by the Ministry of Internal Affairs. The different institutions uh, were instantiations of various disciplinary and professional ideologies. On one end of the spectrum were narcological uh, dispensaries, for outpatient treatment. These are the ones that still exist. On the other end of this uh, spectrum were labor colony-like institutions, um, uh, which were intended for chronic alcoholics who resisted treatment for drunkenness. Um, yeah, so basically kind of uh, prison labor colony-like institutions that existed during the, the Soviet period. Um, this network uh, needed personnel and an additional 1975 degree uh, established the professional uh, designation of psychiatrist narcologist and funded the establishment of departments of narcology at medical schools throughout the country. Narcologist clinical expertise then was authorized as much by the legal provisions for compulsory treatment and by the broader intermeshing of legal and juridical organizations in the Soviet narcological service uh, as it was by their medical credentials. As I argue at length in the book, these close institutional links to the state created a paradoxical set of conditions for Soviet, uh, Soviet narcologists. Their ability to call on the state's means of coercion gave them a certain, like a means to manage patients, right? Um, but it also undermined their legitimacy with many patients. During my field work, many narcologists who had practiced during the Soviet period um, with patients who, who were undergoing compulsory treatment describe the, the deleterious effect that these perceptions and that these interactions had on their attempts to establish trust with patients. So for example, there was a, um, a narcologist named Tamara um, Mitolkina, um, and she who later ran a, a, a small non-commercial addiction rehab outside of St. Petersburg. But in the 1980s, she worked in uh, something called the Spitzkombinatura, which was a clinic attached to a factory, uh, which uh, people who had um, were called recidivists, basically they had been treated more than once. Um, they had been committed to this, uh, to this, uh, 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 this clinic. Um, and she described the difficulty of undertaking psychotherapeutic work with these patients, basically saying, they saw me as a police figure. On the other hand, 
other physicians wistfully recalled the Soviet period as a time when their work had been part of a, what they saw as a kind of coherent system of surveillance and social control over alcoholics, uh, and which they argued provided superior care to the current arrangement. As a clinician who worked in one of the city's outpatient narcological dispen dispensaries once told me, everything was planned out, planned and written out. There was an algorithm. By the time of my first visit to um, the municipal addiction hospital in uh, 2002, elements of the narcological system had changed profoundly, while others reflected a striking continuity with the Soviet period. Shortly after the fall of the Soviet Union, the Russian Federation had moved to dismantle the ex explicitly punitive elements of the system, outlawing involuntary hospitalization for non-criminal alcoholics. Indeed, patients at the municipal addiction hospital generally needed only to inform their physicians in writing uh, in order to end their treatment and be discharged. Physicians at the hospital recounted how in the 90s and early 2000s, they'd struggled to manage the increasing numbers of alcoholic patients, as well as the sudden rise of injected heroin, which was accompanied by a rapid spread of HIV infection. As I discuss in chapter four, these efforts were made all the more difficult by severe budgetary cutbacks in the system um, and the restructuring of the healthcare uh, sector in, in particular. This meant that while basic treatment remained free of charge, the hospital had begun to charge for various uh, additional services. Shortages of medications and staff were also common. Physicians often complained about having to spend more than half their time on paperwork because they lacked computers or administrative support. At the same time, narcology had offered some physicians opportunities for profit during the period of intense economic depression, especially the 90s and, and very early 2000s lots. Um, Narcologists in the state service were paid more than their colleagues in other specialties. Uh, and this was meant to be official remuneration for the difficulty of their work. For physicians or medical researchers whose small salaries were often delinquent or delayed by months, the promise of a specialty uh, was clearly attractive. Again, a, a chapter of the book focuses on the effects of this unevenly regulated market where corruption was common, sometimes with violent consequences. For example, several months after returning from field work, I was shocked and deeply dismayed to learn that the director of the municipal narcological hospital had been arrested for arranging the murder of one of his subordinates, an act which was apparently entangled with an embezzlement scheme taking place at the hospital. So then a final change that swept narcology during the 1990s, we have the, um, the, the um, uh, taking a part of the, uh, 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 the um, I'm sorry, um, the final change that um, swept narcology during the 1990s was the loss of the near monopoly over clinical knowledge and treatment of addiction that it had held during the Soviet uh, period. Narcologists now found themselves competing with a number of different methods and movements. Uh, some of these were imported, like Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, others were homegrown, like the Orthodox uh, Church. And while many uh, non-biomedical practitioners uh, borrowed heavily from narcological therapists, therapies hybridizing them, um, others, like proponents of AA, were either grudgingly tolerant of the state-run service, um, or uh, like the uh, Church of Scientology, which became quite uh, prominent in this, in this arena, were devoted to an explicitly anti-psychiatric and anti-narcological agenda. So many people in the sphere of addiction treatment in St. Petersburg interpreted these shifts as, as a transformation in the basis of narcologists' clinical authority. According to this argument, the most important point of rupture was the collapse of the Soviet party state and the administered economy, uh, which ushered in a move away from state licensed authority to ways um, on the part of narcologists um, and which, which created a situation in which narcologists um, were encouraged to uh, create relationships of dependency uh, uh, on their, with their, uh, 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 their patients. Um, 
As one psychiatrist who is highly critical of narcology put it, under the conditions of the market, the job of the doctor is to attach the patient to himself, to make the patient dependent on him. Now narcologists sought to consolidate their clinical authority through other forms of persuasion in their relationships with patients, which often meant an enactment of charismatic authority in the clinical encounter. And just to, to be more concrete and understand how this worked, it's really necessary to delve into the details of the therapy and care which patients at the hospital received. So while conducting um, early on in my uh, field work, I spoke to a 50 year old factory worker I'll call uh, Vyacheslav. Unlike many of the other hospitals patients, um, he lived in a communal apartment with his wife. He wasn't, he wasn't homeless like many of them. Um, as we sat under the cracked walls of the small examination room, he told me that his son had died in the army six years earlier. Recently, his daughter had given birth to her own children. He gestured towards his motivation for sobriety in describing his new familial role. I'm already a grandfather, but still I continue to drink. Each year, um, he described his stay at the hospital as part of a yearly cycle. Each year he would go on a drinking binge, at the end of which he would be persuaded by his wife to return to the hospital. There, he underwent a week of intensive detoxification. And at the end of his stay, he received an injection of bright pink or blue substance, colloquially known as a torpedo, which he was told would keep disulfiram in his bloodstream over the course of the year. There's also a special injection they give you in your vein, he added. Um, it's all figured out by the professors, so it gradually dissolves. So often referred to in uh, Russia as esperol or antabuse, disulfiram is a chemical that keeps the body from fully processing alcohol. By blocking it and the action of a key enzyme in the metabolic pathway of ethanol, the drug causes a, a buildup of toxic uh, byproducts with uh, unpleasant consequences for patients. Um, in Russia, various disulfiram-based uh, therapies uh, are called sometimes called chemzashita, literally a contraction of chemical protection. Fearing the negative effects of drinking with a substance in his body, Vyacheslav explained that he always waited until the course of his torpedo was over before beginning another binge. Once he tried another procedure, the physicians had implanted a capsule under his skin, which was said to slowly release disulfiram for five years. That time he hadn't been able to wait it out. I didn't drink for two and a half years. Then I paid them uh, and they removed the implant. Typically this cycle re repeated every year, he explained, why he felt that abstaining from alcohol norm, uh, noticeably dampened his social life. He also argued that he and his family had learned to manage his tendency to indulge in drink. What was striking is that his description of disulfiram therapy as a physiologically based treatment um, did not really resemble the way uh, it was presented by narcologists once I started uh, uh, to talk to them. Um, in fact, many uh, 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 narcologists depicted this as a form of uh, 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 psychotherapy. Um, others explained that it was common to inject and implant patients with neutral substances in place of disulfiram, a practice they described as placebo therapy. A narcologist in the acute ward the hospital described it this way. Himzashita is a psychotherapeutic method. In principle, we give you a medication or you can give a placebo. Depends on the personality of the patient. Uh, either we use a placebo or a chemical. I give you this medication. I give you a prohibition through personal psychotherapy. And for a certain period of time, you don't have the right to consume alcohol. If he waits through this period, we do another one. The self-image rises. While it was clear that this uh, method was meant to facilitate stretches of sobriety for patients, it seemed based on such descriptions uh, that the chemical content of the medication mattered less than the meanings enacted by the narcologist and her clinical tools. Indeed, this was one of the family of uh, treatment methods sometimes referred to collectively as kadirovanya, all of which drew on, uh, or coding, which drew on mechanisms such as conditioned aversion, suggestion, and hypnosis to change patients' drinking behavior. In the book, I trace how these methods in Russia have been shaped by a clinical style of reasoning specific to Soviet and post-Soviet psychiatry. Um, I argue that 
This style of reasoning disposed narcologists to amplify patients' responses in three ways. First, through attention to the performative aspects of the clinical encounter. Second, through the management of the broader reputation of uh, Sorry, that's the wrong. Sorry about that. Um, and third, by uh, drawing on their professional authority and reinforcing steeply hierarchical clinical relationships. Some physicians describe patients who were particularly suited for such methods in terms of their tendency or capacity for belief or faith. Even further, some characterize belief as a sort of resource requiring careful management. When I asked about Vyacheslav's a physician, whether he ever administered chemical disulfiram, he said, you understand, we can't give every person the placebo because we'll discredit the, the method that way. Not only did this answer uh, uh, suggest a widespread anxiety, that the method might lose its effectiveness by becoming associated uh, with placebo therapy and thus becoming discredited. The statement itself was aimed at maintaining the, the legitimacy of the therapy. If the effectiveness of this, uh, these methods hinged partly on narcologists' skills of persuasion and performance in their face-to-face -face encounters with patients, it was equally dependent, as the physician saw it, on their successful management of its representation as a pharmacological treatment and an effective one at that. This work of building and maintaining the treatment's legitimacy took place not only during the narcologist's bedside chats, but also in conversations with family members and in, in the media. Physicians used a range of strategies to legitimate their, these treatments. These range from quoting statistics of efficacy to constructing origin stories for treatment modalities that linked them, link them to Russia and depicted them as culturally uh, appropriate. So that's one example of uh, uh, this kind of story about um, uh, therapeutic legitimacy. And I wanna point out that while my argument um, is that narcologists were especially sensitive to the meanings associated with these behavioral methods, this problem of something like therapeutic legitimacy was a general one shared equally by the proponents of Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12-step program in Russia. However, if narcologists face the problem, to simplify it, of translating Soviet therapies for post-Soviet times, then the parallel problem faced by proponents of AA was one of domesticating a problem, a program initially associated with the United States uh, and with Protestantism. So I'm going to shift now and give a, a brief account of. Um, a particular story of uh, uh, therapeutic legitimacy in the domain of um, Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and then I'll just uh, uh, wrap up, and, uh, make sure we have time for Q and A. So the House of Hope and the Hill, which was my second um, big uh, field site, uh, emerged from the philanthropic work of Louis Bantle, a longtime CEO of US Tobacco, a self-described recovering alcoholic and a proponent of Alcoholics Anonymous. In 1992, Bantle had hired um, Evgeny Zubkov, who had recently emigrated to the United States to manage his philanthropic operations. Zubkov was particularly well-suited to play the role of culture broker for 12-step programs in Russia because of his professional background and his network of acquaintances. He had spent nearly a decade at the Bechterev Psychoneurological Institute specializing in adolescent and legal psychiatry. And in addition to his professional ties, he had extensive contacts in the local cultural intelligentsia, particularly in uh, St. Petersburg's informal art and rock music movements. Um, and indeed, his approach to uh, the project was very much to draw on these, uh, these links. Drawing on his contacts, he hoped to knit various informal networks of post-Soviet society into Alcoholics Anonymous' uh, sprawling global uh, network. He argued uh, that three primary factors distinguished the social context of, the, uh, of AA in the US from that of Russia in the early 90s. Uh, 
the respective roles played by professional medicine and religious organizations, and the level of stigma associated with alcoholism. But consequently, Zubkov decided to target three groups, physicians, members of the Orthodox clergy, and well-known members of the cultural intelligentsia. By bringing representatives of each to the United States to tour rehab centers and undergo training for uh, substance abuse counselors. When I met him in 2003, Zubkov was somewhat dis disappointed with the results of his early project in regard to the physicians and the clergy members. A key sticking point with many physicians, for example, was AA's non-professionalism and its ambivalent stance towards formally acquired expertise about alcoholism. I describe that in greater detail in the book. Uh, but here I wanna focus on uh, the area where his efforts were more successful. And that was with the contingent of cultural intelligentsia patients. Um, for many of Zubkov's uh, intelligentsia patients, AA became a means of successfully transforming their own rapidly depreciating Soviet cultural capital. While outspoken supporters of AA in, in Russia included the well-known rock musicians uh, Yuri Shevchuk of DDT and Dusha Romanov of Aquarium. Uh, this was particularly the case for members of the Mitski, an artist group that became known during the 1980s as anti-establishment figures, partly for their enactment of a heroic drunkenness. In 1993, Zubkov brought Dmitry Shagin, one of the artists most central to the group, and the uh, painter and writer Vladimir Shinkaryov to the United States for substance abuse treatment. After their return to St. Petersburg, the two went public with their alcoholism. Chagin became particularly closely involved uh, in the AA movement, establishing a group that met in uh, the Mitski studio space and working on behalf of the uh, House of Hope once it was established. In his conversations with the press and in his own writings, Chagin represented what had previously been an ethos of heavy drinking um, as a disease and advocated Alcoholics Anonymous, not only as a treatment, but as a program for a new way of life. I describe this in greater length in the book. Here I wanna emphasize that the visible links with the Mitski helped to domesticate uh, the House of Hope's brand and Alcoholics Anonymous more broadly. As one counselor put it, um, several patients at uh, House of Hope explained to me how their initial fears about uh, AA being a sect, and this was a particular kind of um, uh, anxiety that circulated in the 90s and early 2000s, um, were allayed by its local association with the Mitski. The Mitski did more than provide familiar faces to prospective members. A speaker at one of the AA meetings held in the Mitski studio explained how her impression of the program was shaped by their involvement. I thought to myself, she said, these are alcoholics? These are intellectuals of the highest class. Um, the intelligentsia, wish of a class. In other words, the Mitski served as objects of identification for prospective AA members who viewed themselves as members of the cultural intelligentsia and others who perhaps questioned the respectability of the program. So that's just an example. There's, there's, there's a lot more I could say about the ways in which uh, AA was uh, domesticated and different aspects of its association with the United States and particularly was uh, managed as part of this kind of process of um, uh, 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 therapeutic legitimacy. So a few words of conclusion. Um, my book gives attention not only to the accounts of physicians, but also those of patients, specifically arguing that while many narcologists have an interest in portraying uh, methods like hypnosis as powerful and authoritative technologies, patients undergoing such treatments do not necessarily experience themselves uh, as controlled by some external agency or something akin to political persuasion. Rather, many patients see treatments such as hypnosis as actually affording them relatively more autonomy uh, than something like a 12-step method, which requires of adherence a full self-transformation, somewhat like a religious conversion. While relationships of dependency do develop between physicians and their patients, these have less to do with any particular clinical methods than the overall social trajectories of patients' lives. Um, as I discussed throughout the book um, as well, themes of agency and responsibility framed in opposing terms of dependence versus autonomy underlay many debates about treatments for alcoholism in Russia. More broadly, I examine um, 
the clinical relationship between physicians and patients in the context of a complex Russian political and social order under Putin in which responsibility, initiative, and personal sovereignty are affirmed as necessary traits in certain spheres, even as relationships of beneficence and obligation are valorized in others. And finally, returning to the theme of care, as I've tried to come at it through this talk, as Margaret Locke and um, Ving Kim Wing have written, quote, in addition to the mastery of biomedical technologies, practitioner selfhood encompasses the political and social processes that confer therapeutic legitimacy. The power to heal is not only a result of individual prowess, but the social relations that accrue to those endowed with therapeutic authority, end quote. Um, as I have suggested throughout, uh, as I suggest throughout the book, Governing Habits, uh, such social relations and processes extend far beyond formal criteria of training and credentialing. Indeed, highlighting uh, therapeutic legitimacy draws our attention to the diffuse and informal processes through which efficacious healing is enacted. Okay, I'm going to end it there. Thank you so much, Eugene. This is this was so insightful, and I'm really looking forward to our uh, um, Q and A session. Just as a reminder to the uh, members of our audience, please uh, do pose your questions to um, to our speaker. You can do so um, by po uh, typing them into the Q and A box uh, if you're watching on Zoom, and uh, to YouTube uh, chat box. Uh, if you are uh, tuning in on YouTube. We already have a couple of questions, but uh, I will take the privilege of asking the first one as a moderator. And uh, my first question would be, I'm very, um, I'm very intrigued by your focus uh, on alcoholism and uh, as opposed to addiction uh, more broadly understood. And so in this, in this sense, my first question would be, um, can you uh, tell us a little bit more about the kind of the cultural and uh, political rendition of alcoholism as a, as a problem as opposed to any other drug addiction or any other forms of addiction that you maybe have come across during your research? Yes, um, that's an excellent question. Um, and I think I, I'll, I'll give a couple of caveats. One is I think um, that what I'm going to say is probably changing and has been changing to, to some degree quickly. Um, but um, the um, one of the really interesting things about uh, doing research in these uh, in these clinical settings, right, was that they were um, they had been designed in some ways to address the problem of alcoholism. Um, other kinds of addiction were um, existed to some degree in the Soviet period and, and to a much greater degree than was ever acknowledged officially, um, but really in terms of absolute numbers, I think it was quite low. And, and really clinicians didn't really start to see um, people um, dealing with things like opiate addiction um, until the, the 1990s. The, the story usually goes that this um, is uh, returned with uh, veterans of the Afghan war from uh, Afghanistan. Um, and then in the in the '90s, when you have um, essentially hard currency markets opening up throughout Russia, heroin comes in along alongside other kinds of commodities. Um, and um, so th there's a lot that can be said there, but essentially, I think that my central like interpretation is that. Um, there was a, a, a very strong kind of cultural distinction drawn between uh, alcohol, uh, alcoholism, anything to do with it as, um, as our own, as Russian, as connected to, uh, as having very long, long standing um, uh, history in uh, and, and links to Russian nationality and identity. Um, and even as a problem, a kind of like our own problem, right? Um, as opposed to uh, narcotics, which were understood as uh, coded as foreign, right? And off 
often uh, in in often in explicitly kind of racialized ways, right? That they were seen as and associated with people from uh, the Caucasus or Central Asia and coming from those those places were associated in policy discussions with issues around, related to, to to terrorism and kind of border crossing, right? So all of that. I'm setting aside the questions of like empirically what was actually going on, but in terms of like the semiotically and the, the meanings associated to them, that was very much the case. And that was reflected strikingly even in um, uh, the kind of socially in the, in the uh, clinics that I was working in. The, um, there was the, there was a, there was a younger group of, uh, mostly young men in their 20s who were um, uh, dealing with drug addiction uh, and they were entirely separate from the older group of people who were um, being treated for alcoholism and they didn't get along. They were very distinct. Um, again, I think that's a kind of epidemiological and clinical picture that's probably increasingly breaking down and becoming much more complicated. Um, but those categories were seen as very distinct. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, I will pose the first question that we have, and I uh, apologize in advance if I mispronounce the, the name of um, the person who posed the question. So we have a question from Safia Jihad Levine, and the question is, thank you for coming today. Are, are there statistics on uh, quote unquote success rates for sobriety or long-term sobriety? Um, right, so for the methods that I was um, talking about, I think that, that one of, there may be something more recent, I need to, to, to look this up. But um, when I was at least up until the point I was writing the book, there was not a lot that was, that, that was available in terms of um, efficacy rates for those kinds of methods. Um, and, and it should be said that the methods uh, that I was describing, um, I think uh, the, the, the suggestion hypnosis-based methods are very prevalent in, in kind of commercialized parts of the system. I think there's a kind of a sense that they're on their way out, or there's a there's a there's a um, there are efforts to try to kind of stamp them out and get rid of them um, in general, and try to replace them with more um, sort of spiritually oriented um, forms of therapy. Um, but uh, yeah, so I don't have a good answer with that. What kind of training did non-medical psychiatrist or counselor, not college or staff. So uh, one of the issues, right. So um, the narcologists were doctors, right? They were, um, but one of the issues was that in the uh, 70s when they, when they created this specialty and especially when they started promoting it in the 1980s uh, during the big anti-alcohol campaign, um, they essentially allowed people to um, other kinds of doctors to train into it with, without becoming, without doing the sort of equivalent of like a full residency in psychiatry. And so there were, there were a lot of complaints about um, people who were underqualified, um, at least during that time and in the, in the 1990s um, entering into the, into the um, profession. And that's something that has been efforts to, to address. Thank you. I had another question about um, other actors who are present uh, uh, in, this, in this kind of uh, relationship of treatment of alcohol addiction. And specifically, my, my, I was interested in the role of the family and uh, as well as kind of whether you noticed any gendered uh, aspects of the care that is uh, provided within the family or any other kind of community uh, uh, within which a person is embedded? Yes. Um, I, okay, so a couple of things I would say. Um, I think there was a kind of prototypical um, story, right, which is 
the one that is um, the, the, the case of the patient I call Vyacheslav, right, is an example of that. Um, and that's where it's the, 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 the patient is, is, is the man and his wife or maybe daughter is kind of bringing him into treatment um, is, and, and they're sort of enacting this kind of um, traditional gendered uh, role where uh, the, uh, the, 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 the wife or the mother or, or daughter is um, um, enacting a kind of, a kind of care, right? Um, in, in getting the, um, but, but also kind of care that's been described as um, uh, where, where, the, where the man sort of plays a role of, of, a, of, a, of a child essentially, right? It is not sort of taking responsibility onto themselves. Um, and what, what's interesting is then this, that, that kind of gendered um, care relationship gets critiqued within the AA world as, um, as codependence. Right. And so there was a lot of really, right? so there was a lot of really interesting discussion among the people in that world trying to make sense of their own relationships. Um, and which were not always gendered in that way, I have to say, like there were definitely women who were being treated, especially both in the, um, uh, in the hospital and in uh, quite, quite a lot in the House of Hope. Um, so it was much more, more complicated. Um, but I think there was something interesting going on in the sort of like rethinking of these, these kind of, and the sort of pathologization in some ways of these traditional gendered um, care roles. The question of like, well, can a Russian mother give tough love, right? In the way an American mother can or not, right? This was a kind of constant uh, uh, set of discussions that, that, were, that were coming up among, among some people. Thank you. And kind of connected to this, I, I was also struck by, uh, I think you mentioned that, I think Vyacheslav, you said uh, he wasn't homeless, unlike many, many other uh, patients in the treatment facilities. And so I was, ask, I was going to ask you about the homelessness aspect of it. Uh, and among the, uh, the patients that you observed in those various um, treatment facilities, various clinics and various kind of kinds of therapy provided. Um, what are the socioeconomic differences that you observed? And also uh, in terms of uh, homelessness and the kind of extreme marginalization, where do these uh, people usually find support or care? Uh, and what kind of care would it be um, uh, compared to kind of other forms of, uh, of treatment that uh, other more kind of high, uh, people who occupy more secure socioeconomic um, position uh, that what they get. So, so the people who were homeless were actually sometimes more likely, I think, to find some kind of care in the municipal center than they would elsewhere because it was actually free of charge, they could, they could stay there for free. Um, and then uh, there was a kind of a, a pattern where some clinicians would, um, you know, there was a certain length of time they would be allowed to be inpatient um, and physicians would just like uh, sign them out and then readmit them. So there were some people who were effectively just living on, on certain wards. Um, and that wasn't a huge number of people, but there was, there, so there was a kind of an attempt by some of the clinicians to eke out some space for, for some patients. And that went along with, um, you know, those patients doing kind of odd jobs around the, the clinic and, um, and then developing a kind of what other people would critique as a kind of a as being sort of dependent on these on these uh, on these clinicians, um, yeah, I wouldn't say. And so, there were relatively few middle class or professional patients at the 
um, at the Gand the, 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 at the municipal narcological hospital. There were a, a few that would come through occasionally, but most of them tended to be um, people who were working class or who were had become, you know, through various alcohol related losses relatively either homeless or um, were um, were very poor and 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 become marginalized in in other ways as well. Um, there's a whole, there's a whole nother set of uh, treatment facilities I think that are catering to some of these commercial clinics right that are catering to um, more middle class and wealthy patients. Thank you. We have another question. Um, so if there is time, would you briefly talk about the seances that you mentioned? Yes, um, I'll just be I'll try to be really quick. Um, it, so basically, it, there's a version of these um, coding Kadirovanya methods, which involve a very elaborate kind of a ritual. Um, and in which there is no um, there's no kind of pretense to giving people a placebo and instead it's just the uh, kind of laying on of hands by the charismatic uh, healer who says uh, that is meant to like start the period of the patient's sobriety um, and this this often involves a big public um, uh, ceremony that prepares patients for it uh, and then an individualized uh, kind of uh, um, uh, ritual as well. Uh, and I, I write about that in, in some detail in the book. But essentially, in some ways, it's, 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 a, it's a version of the same kind of thing uh, that, uh, that, I, that, that I described for it, that I just thought. I really encourage everyone to, to read the book because it's full of such uh, fascinating ethnographic um, stories uh, about yeah, these different situations and treatments that, that are really fascinating. Um, uh, unfortunately, I believe we're at the time and uh, I think this would be a great uh, place to wrap up. I, uh, I want to thank Eugene for a fantastic presentation and everyone for uh, joining us today for the talk. Um, this um, uh, Carly Jackson and the Herman Institute for the support of the series. And uh, if you are interested in, um, in uh, watching any other talks, they will all be available on Herman Institute's YouTube. And so that's it. That was our finale uh, talk. And I wish everyone a great rest of the semester. Take care. Thank you so much, Sutan. <laughs>